Well, I want to welcome you to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And tonight we're scheduled to deal with chapter 11. And that happens to be the way we're closing what we call Unit 1. We're breaking the Gospel of John into two halves for course reasons. But this completes the uh, what we call Unit 1 because the rest of the Gospel deals with his last week, the whole rest of the book, his last week, uh, the, we, the final week of his ministry. So it's a, it's a, a very natural unit. But whenever we enter the Word of God, we always want to do that with prayer. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity that you've extended to us to gather together in the name of our precious Lord. And Father, we do pray for the attendance of your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and lives to your Word, that we each may grow in grace in the knowledge of our coming King. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, indeed, in the name of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, our King indeed. Amen. Gospel of John, and we are in chapter 11. And uh, just to give you a, a refresh review of the, first, the rest of the unit, it started, of course, with the introduction, John chapter 1, which is the introduction to the whole concept of the pre-existent one, that God himself, our creator, entered our creation as a person and to, to fulfill a destiny we couldn't for ourselves. But then the second one is first, the first miracle, the wedding at Cana, and some of those lessons. John 3 is the famous, uh, included the famous visit of Nicodemus and gave rise to the most famous verse in the entire Bible in the terms of, uh, as, as Jesus explains to him, the need to be born again. John 4 was the woman at the well and also the healing of the nobleman's son. John 5 was the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, the, uh, and in John 6, we had the bread of life discourse. And uh, John 7, the living water discourse. And, uh, of course, a lot of other events occurring in there. John 8 is where we had the woman accused in adultery. And that also led to quite a confrontation about legitimacy between the Lord Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. Well, it's one of my favorite chapters for that reason. Uh, John 9 it was the man born blind, and that was a full testimony of many things. And then we had, of course, the Good Shepherd discourse last time. And uh, so tonight we have the close of Unit 1 with the raising of Lazarus. Very familiar story to all of us, but let's be on our guard. When we have a story we know well, we run the risk of being it being so familiar we don't really season it with all it has to offer. So let's look at it with a, with a fresh eye if we can. This entire uh, book is uh, built around seven signs, seven miracles, changing the water into wine, uh, into wine in Cana, uh, healing the official son in Capernaum, healing the invalid in the Pool of Bethesda, feeding the 5,000 at the, at the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, walking on the water on the uh, uh, Sea of Galilee, healing the blind man in Jerusalem. And then, of course, the seventh of the seven signs is the one we're going to explore tonight in chapter 11, the, ra the raising of dead Lazarus in Bethany and these seven signs. But uh, the book, the entire Gospel of John, is also organized around seven miracles, seven discourses, and seven I am statements. And uh, he says, I am the bread of life in chapter 6. I am the light of the world in chapter 8. I am the door, like the door, the, the single way, legal way of entering the tabernacle. Uh, the, uh, I am the good shepherd. That was last uh, in the last uh, gathering. Tonight, we, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and life will be forthcoming as we enter chapters 13 and 14, the upper, form, upper room discourse, and then chapter 7, I am the true vine. There's seven I am statements. He also, by the way, lays claim, Jesus lays claim to each of the elements of the tabernacle. It's another way of parsing these and so forth. He, he makes claim to each one of those. That's a whole other study. But tonight we'll encounter this very famous declaration that we want to take advantage of. So concluding unit one. The raising of Lazarus, interestingly enough, is only recorded in the Gospel of John. There's another Lazarus, different guy, different situation, in Luke. And we'll look at that just by way of contrast before it's through. And uh, so, so John 11 and 12 is 
just heading be, before the final week, uh, we have a, a, a special witness going on of his glory. And of course, this it's a climactic miracle to have someone who's clearly dead. This is not a guy that might have been misunderstood as dying. He was for four days buried. The raising of Lazarus is very unique, very distinctive. There's much to be gained from all of this. We've seen a threefold rejection of Jesus. They sought to slay him back in chapter 5. They took up stones in chapter 8, and the stones again in chapter 10. So there's a threefold rejection highlighted by the expositors. There's also a threefold witness. The raising of Lazarus is one of those, and we're going to see the triumphal entry occur in chapter 12, and we'll see the Gentiles seeking him also in chapter 12. That's all going to be next time. But... Uh, and as I say, the Gospel of John is structured by these seven miracles, the water and the wine, the healing of the nobleman's son, the restoring of the dependent man, multiplying the loaves and fishes at Topka, and uh, walking on the sea, giving sight to the blind, and of course raising the dead. What's interesting about these, there are expositors that lay against these seven events a history of Israel. There's a way, allegorically, that speaks of Israel in seven places. But it's also... Uh, these seven signs apply to you and me. Uh, as a natural man, we too were dead in trespasses and sins. And uh, so there are other cases, by the way, of Jesus raising someone from the dead that aren't mentioned here. We have Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son were other occasions. They, that was up in the, in the uh, it was not away from Jerusalem. Uh, in both cases, they had just died, unburied, and it all happened to be in Galilee. This one is distinctive two ways. He'd been dead for four days, which is relevant to what we're going to talk about. And it's also in Jerusalem, just outside Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, by the way, was a very dangerous place for Jesus to go at this point. And uh, we saw some of that uh, echoing earlier. So let's just jump in. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And uh, so Lazarus, by the way, is an abbreviated form of of the name of Eliezer, which in turn is, means comforter, by the way. That's something that surprised me to discover, but that apparently is, is uh, uh, what it is. And uh, so, Bethany is a house of figs or a house of affliction. It's about two miles east of Jerusalem. Dangerous ground, very dangerous ground, because we know the tensions have built. The, the, the disciples are very apprehensive of Jesus going to Jerusalem at all. And uh, now it's only a one. They were at the end of chapter 10. You may not re remember. They were at Bethabara. That's on the Jordan. That's the house of passage. That's where Joshua originally crossed over and so forth. That was the place that uh, uh, John the Baptist did his baptizing. That's where they were at the end of chapter 10. It's about a full day's journey from the Jordan on foot to Jerusalem. So uh, it's interesting. Jesus waited two days before coming. And John... That's going to make a point of this. Lazarus' burial took place on the day of his death, obviously. The mourning period began immediately and lasted for a month in the Jewish format. The first three days, they hire professional mourners. It's on the fourth day after the professionals that friends are invited to visit. That's the, the, according to Rabbi Edersheim, the, the classical Jewish pattern for us to understand here. And it's interesting here, it says in verse 2, It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So we pick up that little comment that's probably familiar to most of us in the second verse. But there's another clue here that also tells you that John, the writer of the gospel, took for granted you had read the other gospels. Yes, a little subtlety you miss without thinking about it. But he's, uh, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, it's suggestive evidence, not hard evidence, but it's suggestive evidence that John's gospel was after Patmos also. That's one of the things that I think fascinates me. It gave me whole different perspectives because we all tend to assume <clears throat> that John's gospel was early and Revelation is the end of the book, so it's later. No, it's the other way around. The Patmos experience was probably precedent to him writing his gospel. And once you understand that, a lot of other things come into clearer focus, I think. So, so uh, uh, we know that Martha was senior in her house from Luke 10, and Mary is, of course, memorialized in Mark, chapter 14. And John is assuming you know that by that insertion. You with me? Just a little perspective that I think is useful. 
And uh, it's interesting that Mary, in the Gospel of John at least, is always at the feet of Jesus. I like that. And we're reminded of what Paul admonishes Timothy. First Timothy 4, he says, Don't let anything crowd out worship. Take heed unto thyself and do thy teaching. Uh, don't, it's interesting how worship is, the, the contrast between Mary and Martha is, is made in the other Gospels. Martha was very busy, 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 but Mary was criticized for sitting at his feet learning, and he, he commended her for that. Anyway, again, moving down to verse 3. Therefore his sisters said unto him, that is, the sisters of Lazarus sent to Jesus, sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. They didn't understand what he's saying, as you'll see shortly, but that's interesting. Now, the word sick there in the Greek is an unusual word. It means something much stronger. It really means deathly sick and sinking, is what the, the Greek term implies, as is used elsewhere in the Scripture. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Not unto death. In other words, this is not a final end, is what he's saying. But they thought he might be speaking spiritually rather than some other way. It's for the glory of God. We saw the beginning of miracles in John chapter 2 with the wedding at Cana. We're going to see a, another one here, obviously, in John chapter 11. And we're also going to see in John 14, whatsoever ye shall ask. There's a threefold allusion here to the glory of God. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. In other words, there's a special intimacy among the, that family. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He was Bethabara. He didn't come right away. He waited two days. Okay? And uh, he abode two days still in the same place where he went. And so Jesus is apparently deliberately dallying, isn't he? There's a, and I think that's not incidental. See, man's extremity is God's opportunity. And we need to remember that. The dealings of the Father's hand must always be looked at in the light of the Father's heart. And by the way, in that observation is a clue that I want to share with you whenever you're reading a, the, the Gospels or anywhere in the Whenever you see an episode or an incident, the first thing you want to really draw from that is what is that teaching you about the Father's heart? You know, we have those ten talents where the one guy had one talent, the other had five, the other had ten, and so forth, and the guy that had one uh, really gets criticized, if you will. Because he had only one talent? No. It's because of his view of God that's, that he presumed. And you miss that unless you're watching for it. No, the, the real clue, I think, to really extract the meaning of events and conditions and even the parables, what have you, is what is it teaching you about the, the heart of the Father? And uh, I, so I just throw that out. Then after, he saith to his, uh, that, after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again? See, they're over by the Jordan. That's quite a ways from Jerusalem. It's a, yeah, okay. And so, goest thou thither again? What the Greek really structures here says the Jews just now sought to stone thee. And you're going to go again. You're going to just, you, in other words, you're asking for trouble is the idea here. Jesus answered, I love this, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. And, of course, he's not talking about daylight or nightlight here. He's, talking, so he's using it metaphorically, obviously. And so, are there not twelve hours? Uh, has not the day a, a definitely allotted time, is really what he's saying here. And uh, so, uh, he that walketh in the night stumbleth. And, of course, we have interesting allusions to stumbling in the, in the, uh, goth, in the uh, epistle of Jude. Uh, the oh, there are many lessons there, but we'll move on here. It's interesting, though, Jesus' death could not take place but for the time appointed by the Father. So he's actually secure that, the, of course, the disciples don't have that perception. Yet, not, yet at least. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. 
but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. <laughs> In other words, if he's sick, he's sleeping, that must be good for him. See, they don't get the fact that he's using that metaphorically. And uh, the, the word sleep here. Uh, this word is used for death several times in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it is used only for believers. Only for believers. There's a very deliberate uh, editing going on here by the Holy Spirit. Why does the Holy Spirit use the word sleep? This is a, there's a list of reasons. Sleep, first of all, is harmless. So is the death to the believer. Sleep comes as a welcome relief. And uh, we've just had some dear friends pass away recently, and that's a comfort to realize that. We often don't because we miss them. And yet, it can come as a welcome relief. We lie down to rise again. See, it's a very, very interesting metaphor the Holy Spirit's used here. And uh, it's a time of rest, indeed. And uh, it shuts out the sorrows of life. It speaks of the ease with which the Lord will awaken us. He just speaks our name. Isn't that, 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 that's cool, I like that. And uh, it's a time when the body is fitted for the duties of the morrow. You and I are not over when we die. We'll just be getting our assignments for the next uh, cycle. There's another death that's worse. And there are two, de two diseases, HIV positive and SIN positive. They're both terminal and they both uh, have a blood cure. But we'll move on here. Uh, alienated from the life of God is what you're really worried about. So Jesus says, I, I may awake him. In other words, there's no way that Lazarus is self-sufficient, totally dependent. Lazarus could not raise himself. We need to realize that. That's going to be emphasized as we go here. Now, the, obviously, the disciples think he's talking about sleep as we think of sleep. So it says here, Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. So then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. It always interests me that the word of God is pure. It clarifies. It doesn't prevaricate. He's using a metaphor. They're misunderstanding it. He corrects it. And uh, fair enough. And uh, Lazarus is dead. Now it's interesting. Jesus knew he died. There was no second message. The message he got is that he was ill. Two days had gone by, but Jesus knew he died. So there is actually is a, 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 a omniscience going on here. Verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So you begin to realize what the undercurrent here that I think is pretty clear in the text is Jesus is deliberately dallying. He's not trying to rush there to catch him before it gets worse. He's, he's setting the stage here for a demonstration of the glory of God. That ye may believe is the objective. He's going to he's seeking a higher manifestation of God's glory. And so, the mightiest display of Christ's power prior to his own death is going to occur here in this chapter. And that's a, that's a phenomenal thing as you think about it. Lazarus is clearly dead. It's acknowledged in the community. You've got professional mourners. There's no ambiguity about his condition. And he is going to come back to life. It's interesting to observe there is no record of anyone dying in the presence of our Lord. Even the two thieves on the cross die after he does. Nowhere in the scripture can you find a case where someone dies in the presence of of Jesus, I think that's that's interesting, and uh, yeah, I, I'm always I'm always fascinated by those editorial subtleties. There may have been someone died in his pre presence, but it's not recorded. It's not there. It's not visible. Uh, there are seven women that are Gentile brides of various people throughout the Bible. There's seven of them. In no case is their death recorded. I didn't say they don't die, but editorially. They don't die. I, think, I, I don't think that's accidental. I think there's a message there. And uh, faith lessons are, of course, developed gradually in steps. And the scripture tells us that. And our prayer should be that these lessons not be wasted on any of us. The disciples 
Martha, Mary, all learning in steps, and so do you and me. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with them. <laughs> you know, you get the, you get the uh, clear impression that he was kind of a, <laughs> a pessimist here. But clearly the disciples were uh, apprehensive about Jesus going to Jerusalem because they, they knew the tensions and they were out to kill him. They weren't out to confront him anymore. There's a, uh, that's what's coming. So Thomas really just probably is articulating the mood of the group. Yeah. Let us also go that we may die with him. Reminds me of what Dr. Teller told me. Uh, we were at lunch, that dinner once and he said, uh, asked him a certain kind of question. He says, Chuck, you have to understand what a pessimist is and what an optimist is. And we all listened because we knew something was coming. He says, the pessimist is the one with more information. We sort of winced. He says, an optimist is one who thinks the future is uncertain. <laughs> we all winced with that one. And then he looked me right in the eyes. It's our duty to be an optimist because then we at least try. So that was, that was his perception of, of life in general, secularly. Uh, Thomas called Didymus. Uh, in Aramaic, Didymus is it's the same word in the Greek. It means a twin, if you will. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now, Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. That's a, a, a threat uh, assessment there, if you will. Bethany is on dangerous ground. Um, we infer that Jesus came to Bethany. But on the other hand, there's another perspective here. One day is a thousand years. is now 4,000 years since Adam. So that's another interesting aspect, because this is the last Adam. One of the titles of Christ is he's the last Adam. And that becomes very clear in Revelation 5. You really won't understand the fifth chapter of Revelation unless you really understand uh, that aspect of it. But in any case, they're in Bethany. It's, 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 it's enemy turf, if you will. And uh, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now, uh, uh, Bethany is about f uh, f uh, 15 furlongs off. That's about two miles, for those of you who don't, don't play horses. Um, Jesus came to Bethany, and uh, Jesus had laid on the ground four days. Fair enough. Okay. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. I think that's interesting. Many of the Jews came. See, this is building an audience that the Pharisees will not be able to deny. When this all happens, there's plenty of witnesses. There's no way to sweep this under the carpet. Many of the Jews came to Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. And uh, so, the, uh, see, the, with the, the Jews coming, that made it impossible for the Sanhedrin to discredit the last great sign of the Messiah. But that's getting ahead of us here. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Now, she is partially correct and partially incorrect here. Okay. At what you ask, the word ask, by the way, is a very special word, aito, which is to, to ask, beg, call, crave, desire, require. It's the word used when men are praying to God. It's the right word she chose. What she's ignoring is that she's talking to God. You see, because Jesus, was the God was standing in front of her. But that's an insight that comes later, I think. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again on the resurrection at the last day. So she's assuming he's just using a cliche here, if you will. That's my way of categorizing it. You know, there are two resurrections. Revelation 20 makes the, the second resurrection occurs, second resurrection occurs in several stages. And so uh, these are categories, not serial events. So that's a whole study uh, we won't try to get into here. And beauty for ashes and oil for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, Isaiah 61. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that l believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? This is a very, very fundamental declaration. It may be so familiar to our ears, we don't really appropriate the depth of it. 
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's quite a claim. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you really believe that? That's what he's asking. Believest thou this? Easily, it's easy to nod in, a, in a, a group like this where we're all in agreement. But that's a heavy thing to really appropriate that, to really understand this is for real. And uh, the word uh, dead is, a very, is past tense. The Greek there really says was dead. Yet shall he live. That's a present participle. Continue to live. Even in the grammar there, there's an emphasis that we miss in the English translation. And of course, the ultimate death is what Revelation 20 deals with there, the second death. And the real question that we all need to take, and I suggest this is the question that we should take home with us tonight, is have you really laid hold of this? Does, does Death should have no threat to us. It's, it's, it's uh, releasing. As long as there's life, there's hope. No, no, it's the other one. As long as there's hope, there's life. Hmm? Okay. Believe in me, those that believe in me shall live, Jesus said. Notice the order of that. You see, D doctrinally, dispensationally, and prophetically, the belief comes first, and the life comes, derives from that. That's doctrinal, of course. It's also dispensational, and it's also prophetic. And you can jot those verses down at John 5 and Acts 2 and, and John 20 and 1 Thessalonians 4 to chase that down yourself. But uh, so they have, they have uh, um, all three of those aspects. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master's come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. So the previous dialogue is with Martha. Mary now finds out she's now at his feet. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She's always at his feet, by the way. I think if you study it, it's interesting. She's always sitting at uh, so. Uh, she was weeping because she hadn't read Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to them who are to love God and them who are called according to his purpose. But I'm being a little facetious with that, of course. Jesus permitted it, so it, it must be for the best is another way to look at that. And, uh, and at his feet, he's, she's always at his feet. I think that's interesting. Uh, in his role as prophet in Luke 10, she's at his feet. In his role as priest in John 11, uh, he's at his feet. And we'll see in Matthew 26 as king that she will be at his feet. So, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And then we have the shortest verse in the Bible, in the English translation at least. That's Jesus wept. There actually is a verse that's shorter but in the Greek, but that's neither here nor there. Jesus wept. That's interesting. He knew Lazarus. Lazarus, he knew he was going to be raised, but he weeps. I think that's interesting. In fact, he actually groaned, deep feeling, distressed to extreme degree. The Greek word is enebremesato, which means to snort with anger like a horse. Strange word, but the, the Greek is a, is, is, is a Septuagint, it's violent displeasure. Uh, troubled. Groaning is perhaps an easy way to say it. If we look at Mark 8.12 and Matthew 8.17, we get, we draw the inference that the miracles cost him something. They weren't just pushing a button. It cost him something. Scripture records Jesus weeping three times. He's weeping here, of course. He weeps over Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. We'll encounter that in chapter 12. 
very briefly, but in Luke 19 is the full development of that. And uh, at Gethsemane, he weeps. In fact, he weeps drops of blood. And so those three occasions that he's weeping. Isaiah described him as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Interesting, there's no mention of the other raisings, Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son. That, that was in the Galilee. This is in Jerusalem. And uh, the scripture says he giveth not an account of any of his matters. So anyway, we'll move on. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, <laughs> said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. You know, you can't really improve on the King James. You know, some people like modern translations. Somehow, the majesty on the one hand and the candor on the other of the King James, I, I find uh, very, very attractive. Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead these four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? I have to presume that despite the dialogue here, they had no grasp of what was about to happen. I think this is the, the it was quite an event. Take away the stone. You know, it's interesting, God does not do for us what we can do for ourselves. See, we still have to brush our teeth in the morning, right? And it's interesting to notice how often he works through the disciples. Now, D.L. Moody says, uh, take away the stone of unbelief, prejudice, and secularism, sectarianism. And I think that uh, taking away the stone is emblematic here. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. You know, this must have been starting to create some real apprehension. This is an unpleasant exposure. You know, they're opening a tomb that's going to be very fragrant. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people would stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus speaking audibly for our benefit, so to speak. Father, I thank thee. That points to John eleven fourteen 14, Bethabara, same thing there. But believe, then see. There's that order again. Believe, then see. It's not seeing is believing. Believing is seeing. Why doesn't he hear our prayers, you might ask? Huh? Well, Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If the Lord isn't hearing us, it may be sin in our lives. Or John 1, uh, uh, 1 John uh, 3, verse 22, Whatsoever ye ask, ye receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. See, the coin has two sides. We need to be pleasing to him, not in rebellion. Jesus himself ever lives to make intercession for us. And very much of the flavor of Elijah Carmel. And he's still at it now. Hebrews 4, uh, uh, 7.25. He ever liveth to make intercession. For That's his full-time job right now. Did you realize that? After the are so there's a lot of things that happen. But until then, what is he doing between here and there? His full-time job is to pray for you and me. It's glibly said, but... It's, Awesome, if you realize what that means. The Word of Christ gave life, and this is his last great public witness, because it's going to get different here as we move into the subsequent chapters. And, uh, and it's not to be confused with the resurrection. That will be treated in the next session, in Unit 2, of course. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him, and let him go. And uh, you know, it's interesting in John 5, we remember he said, Marvel not at this, the hour is coming in which they that are in the grave shall hear his voice. 
And it's been suggested, why did he say Lazarus come forth? To keep the rest of them not coming. In other words, he's calling one. If he hadn't said Lazarus, the, the inference by some scholars is that they all would have come forth. And the day will come when that will happen. I have this... Uh, um, well, let me back up for a minute. The voice that's speaking here is the same voice that called the universe into existence. The voice that's speaking here is the voice that John heard at Patmos in chapter 4, verse 1, come up hither, which I believe uh, is, is the Harpazzo model there, if you will. It's my suspicion that at the Harpazzo, the shout of, that, will, that will come will be our voice. I believe we'll be called by name. We'll each hear our own name called. That's, I suspect that's going to be true. Okay. So Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> A voice so loud it would wake up the dead. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and uh, same lips which called the universe into existence by the mere declaration of his mouth. He that was dead came forth. Jesus himself held the keys to of death and Hades. This demonstrates a victory over Satan right there. Right there. How can any sheep of his hand ever perish when he held such a hand? We covered that in chapter 10, but I think it echoes right here to realize how powerful that is. And this illustrates his conquest over Satan. Now, I want to talk about these grave clothes. Um, and Redpath makes quite a thing of that, and I think he's right on. It's interesting that he, Jesus always works through his disciples. Take off his grave. He, he tells them to get rid of the grave clothes. Remember, water and wine, he had the disciples deal with that. Feeding the multitude, the loaves and fishes, the disciple. He uses the disciple. He always works through rolling the stone away. The disciples. Now, freeing the grave, the grave clothes. Freeing the, uh, Lazarus from the bondage of corruption. And uh, now, Lazarus was in four conditions. First of all, he was dead. So are you and me. Before we encounter Christ, before we have that benefit, we are dead. Dead to sin and a, a destiny accordingly. The next step, Lazarus became, was called to life, but he was still def he was tied by his grave clothes. Can you visualize him coming out of the, the cave? He's freed. He's alive. Wow. But he's trembled. He's, he's wrapped. He's... Loose him, is what he's, he, he, Jesus tells his disciples. He's trembled with grief. So are we. That's the lesson here, I think. And most of us are alive, but hindered by our own grave clothes. Hindered by false ambitions. Hindered by um, unnecessary appetites. Uh, hindered, you can make your own list, every one of us. I think it's in the homiletics. I think the homiletics here are in the grave clothes. Now, once they release him, they go and they un take off the grave clothes. He becomes dangerous. He's now able to go around and witness, show himself. So they had to kill him. In chapter 12 and verse 10, we're going to discover the Pharisees couldn't handle it. They had to get him killed. He couldn't have this guy walking around having been raised from the dead. Now understand, we're on the threshold of the, the holidays, Passover. There's crowds of strangers coming from all over the world to celebrate the holidays. And this guy's walking around that's been raised from the dead. That word would travel. So he was dead, then he was defeated, but then when he's freed, he's dangerous. Are we dangerous? We've been made alive by Jesus Christ. Are we still trampled with our grave clothes? If we shed those, we become dangerous. Praise God for that. Dangerous in a constructive sense. Da dangerous on behalf of uh, 
the, the, the kingdom of our Lord. And of course, the fourth D is when he dines with Jesus. In chapter 12 and four, chapter 14, we'll discover that Lazarus is sitting there with dinner. So that's the, the four Ds. He was dead, then defeated, but then dangerous. And then he dines. And I'm going to suggest that those four Ds can be applied to our personal lives. I'm going to suggest that we, in a prayerful, devotional time, might reflect on that in terms of are we, each of us, hindered by our grave clothes? Now, we can't talk about Lazarus and John without realizing there's another Lazarus that the Bible talks about, a different guy, different circumstance, but useful to, con to compare here. And this is the Lazarus in Luke, okay? Luke 16. Most of what we think we know about the life after death, we'd learn from a careful study of Luke 16, surprisingly enough. It's a very interesting, it's not a parable, by the way. It's an actual description. So let's just skim through it by way of review. I think we can slip it in the study here just by way of review. Jesus tells us in Luke 16, there was a certain rich man. See, there was a certain rich man. This is not a hypothetical guy. Which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now notice... The guy has a name. This is a real thing. This is not a parable. It's not just a story to teach something. No, it's an actual incident. These are historical characters with real names. He was laid. He's apparently a cripple. He had to be laid at his gate. He didn't get there and lie down. He was laid at his gate full of sores. Okay? And uh, it's interesting, the same form uh, is, is Eliezer. Is, uh, so, okay. And uh, there are two reasons, I believe that the scripture emphasizes name to demonstrate that it really happened. It wasn't just a rhetorical device. The second thing is that the rich man likely didn't know his name, but Jesus did. Jesus knew his name. I think that's relevant to the story here. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, and moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that when the, de the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. Now, death is not the end. It's the beginning of a whole new existence in another world. That's, what's, that's what Jesus is communicating to us here. Lazarus, by the way, was righteous not because he was poor, but because he depended on God. The rich man was not condemned because he was rich, but because he didn't use his resources properly. Abraham was among the wealthiest in the world. And yet, yet, uh, yet he was not in torment in Hades. He he's, he's, becomes an idiom for the good part of Hades. I'll come back to that. And in, hell, in Hades, I should say, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, that's the rich man, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now the word uh, hell in your English is actually a translation of the Greek word Hades, and I'll come back to that. Abraham's bosom is an idiom, if you will, for the good side of Hades, the paradise side of Hades, uh, in the Old Testament in times of death. And uh, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. And uh, for the Christian, death means to be present with the Lord. For the unbeliever, death means to be separated from God's presence, which results in a tormented state. And uh, now the word hell is derived from the Saxon halan, which means to cover, hence the covered or invisible place is what it means. In Scripture, there are four words that are actually translated into the English, hell. One is Sheol, that's the Hebrew word from the Old Testament. Hades is the Greek term from the New Testament. Gehenna is another thing I'll come back to. It's quite a different thing. And then Tartarus is yet another thing. Though these are four words that you need to be sensitized to if you're going to get into this area. And uh, Sheol, of course, is Hebrew. It occurs in the Old Testament 65 times. It's derived from a root word meaning to ask or demand. Hence, it's insatiable. It's insatiableness is what it means. It's never full, in other words. It's rendered grave 31 times, but that's actually a mistranslation. And I'll just explain why in a minute here. And uh, it's rendered hell 31 times in the authorized version in place of... It's the place of the disembodied spirits is the concept that's trying to com communicate here. This is not to be confused with the grave. The grave and shoal are very different. A grave is physical. It receives bodies. You can have graves in the plural. You can own a grave. Sheol is singular. 
never used, uh, excuse me, is never used in the plural. It's a specific place that uh, no one owns. It's not that kind of a thing. And so the uh, Hades is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew show. It's a word that which, that which is out of sight it denotes the place of the dead. It's translated hell 11 times in the New Testament. Uh, it, the Septuagint uses Hades to translate the Hebrew word Sheol uh, on 61 occasions. So for our purposes, H Hades and Sheol are equivalent, really. And uh, it, it is viewed in the Greek mind, it has two subterranean divisions, Elysium and Tartarus. Elysium is the paradise, Tartarus is the, the dark, bad side of it. It shows up in Homer's Iliad and other places. And uh, so uh, s some view the blessed dead as part of Hades called paradise. And, and it, 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 the idiom used here is Abraham's bosom. And uh, the rich man lifted up his eyes. The bosom of Abraham was far off. He knew it was there. He could communicate with it, but he couldn't get at it. It's a strange uh, separation here. Abraham's bosom is in heaven, we know from Matthew 8 and elsewhere. Okay. Now, Gehenna is a different term. It's a term that comes from the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, which was a deep, narrow ravine to the south of Jerusalem separating Mount Zion from the so-called Hill of Evil Council. I'm always amused by the Hill of Evil Council because that's where the United Nations has set up their headquarters. I don't think they understood the name of that hill when they did that. But anyway, we'll go on here. Here the idolatrous Jews offered their uh, children in the sacrifice to Moloch. They hid at the, heated this bronze arms and put their infants in there and burned them. And there was, there was actual infant uh, sacrifices in the days of their uh, uh, paganism. And uh, so the Gehenna then becomes, it, after it becomes a city dump, it's always burning. And so it becomes an idiom f to speak of a place of everlasting fire and burning. That's where the word comes from. Gehenna comes from the Valley of Hinnom as an idiom. And it's used by the Lord 11 times in that way as an idiom for the, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And uh, the lake that burns with fire, that's Hades is temporary. It's at the end, after the millennium, that, that uh, uh, Hades is thrown into Gehenna. Gehenna is a final, permanent thing. And that's the concept you want to understand. Hades is temporary. It will ultimately cast into Gehenna in Revelation 20. And uh, Gehenna is, is outside time. We have no grasp of what that means. It really is forever. Hades is in the earth, apparently. It sounds like, at least idiomatically, it's geocentric. And uh, it's interesting that Gehenna is in the outer darkness, although that phrase is misunderstood. Uh, I won't get into that here. Uh, there's a wide misunderstanding of that phrase. It's used in a different way in, the, in uh, Matthew, but most many people would link it up. And uh, now the uh, Hades is associated with the bottomless pit at the abyss, and I'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, so Tartarus is another term. It only appears once in the New Testament. And it's the deepest abyss of Hades, apparently. In Homer's Iliad, it's described as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. Think about that. It is far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So I, I don't know where it is, but I don't want to go there. Okay. It's a very specific place of incarceration of the angels that sinned and from Genesis 6. And that's confirmed both by Jude and Second Peter chapter 2. So that's a, these are all very real issues that we need to understand if you're serious about your Bible. And... Uh, the abuso is another term that's related to this. It's translated the bottomless pit or the abyss. The Greek, it's the abusos. Um, that's where the beast of Revelation comes out of. That's where he comes from, strangely enough. People miss that. And where Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Not annihilated yet. His par two partners are. But he isn't. For a thousand years, he's incarcerated. Then he's released for a short while. And then finally put down for, for good. It's also the place from which the demon locusts emerge in... Revelation chapter 9. And uh, so now, so the underworld, the model here is that Hades consists of two things, a place of torment and a Abraham's bosom. And there is an impassable gulf between those two. That's the Greek conception, but that's the conception that's reinforced by Luke 16, if you will. And there's also this bottomless pit, which may or may not be a part of the impassable gulf. There's no reason that they might need to be the same, or they might be. That's, that's neither here nor there. And so, the, uh, and Tartarus is probably associated with that also. And so, some insights here. The man in Hades, in Luke 16, is fully conscious. That's an interesting thing to understand. He has memory. 
He's speaking. He endures pain. He has desires. His eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed. Never changed. Not changeable. That's the, that's the reality. He has no hope. We can't imagine being without hope. He knew that what he was experiencing was fair and just. As he carries on the dialogue there, he, he understands it's just and appropriate. That's amazing to realize. He's not, making, he's not complaining about that. He also knew exactly what his brothers needed to do to avoid his own fate. That's to repent. See, it's an amazing amount of information we glean from this description of our Lord in Luke 16. He was not yet in hell, that in the sense of, uh, of Gehenna, only Hades. It's a temporary holding place, but it's not pleasant. So anyway, the rich man said, he cried loud and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Wow. Okay. There's no soul sleep here. He's conscious and aware. The punishment of lost sinners is not remedial. It does not improve them. Hades and Gaina are not hospitals for the sick. They are prisons for the condemned. We need to understand that. But Amos said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So that's the predicament here. And there's a, we get into the vocabulary, but basically, some conjecture that Busso is involved with a geocentric topology. The only place topologically that one can have a bottomless pit would be at the center of the earth. And so that may be just idiomatically consistency, or there may be something even more fundamental to it. So if we take this model, after the cross, Jesus came and took those in Abraham's bosom with him. And so that's, and that's what we infer from 1 Peter 3.19 and some other passages. And so uh, Ephesians 14, that the bosom was evacuated at the, uh, after the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Christ was the first fruits of them that slept. That was the feast of first fruits being fulfilled. And... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and, and we get into a whole study on that. And so, then said he, I pray thee, that, the, the rich man says, pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Interesting, the rich man understood what had to happen. That's what he's pleading for. He has a concern for the lost, but can't do anything about it. There was one that did come back from the dead, and that's, of course, Lazarus. And uh, it's interesting, a, maybe the Holy Spirit has a smile on his face. There's a pun involved because they're two different people. The response of the chief priests, of course, was to, to kill him, that, the Lazarus that we speak of in, in John 11. See, faith that is based solely on miracles is not a saving faith. That may be a shock. That may be a shock. Faith that is based solely on miracles is not a saving faith. Okay. Jesus spoke more of hell than of heaven. They both are real. This should preempt all of our other priorities. Everything else in our lives, when we get up in the morning every day, this fact should preempt all of our other agendas, all our other priorities. Heaven is real. Hell is also The safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. That's the most dangerous, that's the safest one, that's also the most dangerous one because it's so innocuous. Many ask, how can a loving God even permit such a place as hell to exist, let alone send people there? See, in asking that very question, they reveal they do not understand two things. They do not understand the love of God, and they do not understand the wickedness of sin. You've got to put those into the equation to really understand that. And I don't want to make this whole study of this, but I just, this has seemed appropriate time to review this from Luke uh, 16. God's love is a holy love, not a shallow sentiment. 
Sin is a rebellion against a holy and loving God. Those two realities is we need to confront. There's no way around it. Those are two realities you can't escape. God's mercy is unobligated and sovereign because he's God. Well, let's talk about the other Lazarus contrast. So Luke 16 is the one with the beggar here versus the man of means in John 11. The one in Luke 16 was, un, was uncared for. Dogs licked his so, things, so forth. The, the Lazarus in John 11 had loving sisters. Luke 16 had crumbs from another's table. John 11, he, he, he was at the table with Jesus. Luke 16, the beggar that remained in the grave versus the one here brought back from the dead. And of course, the one there will also be resurrected, but the Old Testament saints are resurrected at the second coming, not at the Harpazo. That's a technicality that many, many people miss. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. No kidding. I can't imagine someone being present that wouldn't be shook. Uh, whatever presuppositions he shows up with, I think, would be cast aside pretty quickly. They believed, many believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. I'll bet you that was a popular message. <laughs> now, they came to Mary. Mary must have been somebody very special. They came to Mary. I think that's in itself interesting. Well, then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Interesting. They don't deny the miracles. They can't. They're, stared, you know, they're there. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. <laughs> Boy. Chief priests, Sadducees, Pharisees. There they are. This man doth miracles. They own the genuineness, of, they acknowledge the genuineness of the miracles. They were determined not to believe, and that's usually the case in disbelief. It's a, term, it's a, it's a commitment. And the threat was to take away their temple, which is a fear they had, of course. Forty years later, that's exactly what does happen. The Roman army did come. They destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple and carried the entire nation into captivity. Anyway, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that year. Now you understand, Annas was the one that should have been, but Caiaphas was the Roman appointee, so the two of them are both in power for different reasons, both corrupt. One of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, he said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and the whole nation perish not. That's a prophecy by him, similar to the one in Luke 20. It's very interesting. Here he inadvertently is prophesying. It's expedient for us that one man should die for the people. He did. He did. He did. And uh, died for the people. And the word in the Greek is hoopered, in the stead of the people. Just like Balaam, who also prophesied against his will. That's another comparison. But let's keep moving here. And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Indeed, indeed. That's, that's the agenda, by the way, that he, he will quote as he enters Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I will gather thee like a can catch your chicks and so forth. The greatest crime done in the world brings the greatest blessing ever given to the world. Anyway, from that day forth, he, they took counsel together for to put him, that's Jesus, to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And for whom did Christ die? And you've got seven passages you can chase down that will be in your notes. Uh, for whom did Christ die? For them indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, see, he walked no more open among the Jews. Jesus knew of the decision that they had made. He knew he had a price on his head, so to speak. And Ephraim is about 20 miles north of Jerusalem, about five miles east of Bethel. 
And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They sought, then, then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and Pharisees had given a commandment, that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. So this ends Unit 1. That's the end of the chapter. And I, what you might want to do in your notes is to contrast this mood with the very first chapter of the unit, which introduces the pre-existent one, introduces us to the whole concept of light in contrast to darkness and so forth. But for your next session, you're going to prepare for our reading John chapter 12. And those of you that may have some background in the Deutero-Isaiah theory are in for a surprise. I don't know about your personal experience with biblical studies, but when I was an early teenager encountered this idea that the, 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 the intellectuals say that really there were two Isaiahs, Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2, and there's a reason they talk about that, that really set me back. And uh, uh, I, I didn't really buy it, but it certainly put a cloud on, my, on, on chasing scholarship. And I've, I'm just so indebted, too indebted to this one verse in chapter 12 that it's become one of my most precious possessions. And I'll explain that to you when we're going through that chapter next time. But this, uh, this chapter 12 begins unit 2 and the final week of Jesus' ministry on the planet Earth. And uh, so that's, uh, with that, let's uh, bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you that in Jesus we have life. We thank you, Father, for the reality that he has the keys of hell and of death. We thank you, Father, for the lessons, the many lessons that are uh, bound up in the raising of Lazarus. Uh, 